Okay. Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today uh, for this thematic webinar on uh, interlinkages between climate change and biodiversity. Uh, it's the second thematic webinar um, as part of the Edinburgh process, uh, the subnational, uh, the consultation of subnational governments and local governments for the post 2020 uh, global biodiversity framework. Um, I will be introducing and moderating the discussion today. Um, this event has been uh, co-organized by IDRI, the uh, Institute of Sustainable Development and International Relations, uh, and the Eden Book Process team. So first I would like to thank them for the great work and uh, adaptability to those uh, challenges and changes and for uh, supporting this opportunity to have uh, fruitful discussions on many different topics uh, online. <laughs> And um, we are especially delighted to hold this uh, thematic webinar during the Biodiversity Week, as uh, the 22nd uh, of May, which is Friday, is the International Day for Biodiversity. And uh, again, it's uh, an occasion to, to trigger more discussions and debates on, on this topic. Uh, so I, I will remind you, I remind you all the, the participants to keep uh, your, your mic on mute for now and to, to you can you could have the opportunity to reopen the mic at the end of the of the discussion uh, i will now leave the floor to Stu, who is going to present uh, the all consultation process uh, for which the webinar is part of thank you thank you julia so i forgot to unmute myself there so not a great start <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. As you, you said, I'm Sue Campbell from the uh, Scottish Government's Environment and Forestry Directorate and I'd like to thank Juliet for giving me a few precious minutes in this webinar to explain a little bit about the Edinburgh process and how this thematic webinar on the linkages between climate change and biodiversity fits into that process. It's really exciting for us in Scottish Government to be working with partners such as the Institute for Sustainable Development and International Relations to deliver this webinar to you. And I hope that everybody participating will find it useful and informative to not only uh, their own knowledge, but also to the Edinburgh process. So next slide, please. So the Edinburgh Process, or to give it its full name, the Edinburgh Process for Subnational and Local Governments on the Development of the Post 2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. You can see why we shorten it. Uh, it's been developed to ensure that the views and the aspirations of authorities that sit below national or state level are included in the post 2020 framework. And this includes the views of regional and evolved governments, uh, local authorities and cities. The UN's Convention on Biological Diversity are currently developing the post-2020 framework and it will be finalised at COP15 in China. Um, the date is to be confirmed for next year. And given the key role of subnational governments in delivering for biodiversity at local levels, it's right that we feed subnational views into the framework development process uh, so that um, the actions uh, uh, that we deliver are realistic and deliverable. And so we've developed this Edinburgh process in conjunction with the CBD and with our global partners that you can see on the right hand panel on this slide. Um, and these partners include organisations that play a leading role within the subnational constituency. On the next slide, um, it sets out the, the timeline of the Edinburgh process, which we started um, on the 24th of April, and it continues up to COP15 next year. Two weeks ago, we held a series of regional online information sessions to provide more detail on the process, and those are highlighted in the yellow box. And if you missed those sessions, you can find them on our YouTube channel and the links to those are available or through, that, through our Attendify app. 
Uh, we opened our consultation documents on the Zero Draft and the Subnational Plan of Action, a renewed Subnational Plan of Action, on the 20th of April. And these are open until the 29th of May for your um, comments. Again, the links to those consultations can be found through our Attendify app. And I'm delighted that alongside our partners, we've been able to put together these themed webinars, which is, are highlighted in the red box, uh, to discuss in more detail some of the issues that are included in the post-2020 framework, and which will be central to the role of subnational authorities. Um, we've got that webinar series underway, and we are looking to take the key issues arising from these discussions and feed them back into the CBD so that we can set out a stronger role for subnational actors within the framework. And we'll be feeding um, back the outputs from these webinars and also from the consultations um, to participants of the Edinburgh process through further regional online sessions in the week of 29th of June. So going back to the thematic webinars, which is why we're here, uh, the next slide sets out the various themes that we are discussing. Um, the first thematic webinar was held last week and hosted by our partner ICLEI. And we discussed monitoring and reporting tools sharing examples of different biodiversity platforms that are used to capture biodiversity across urban areas, um, mainly urban areas, but we considered that those tools should and could be applied across regional level. Um, if you've missed that webinar, uh, you will find the link uh, to the YouTube recording on Attendify. And as I say, the Zoom, Zoom links to all the webinars shown here are on Attendify. And if you've got any problems in accessing um, the app or the Zoom links, please contact the Edinburgh Process email address. For today, I'd like to congratulate um, Edry on developing today's exciting webinar programme. Uh, both Alexandra and Juliet have made a Herculean effort in putting together today's programme and um, we in the Scottish Government very much appreciate the hard work and we're looking forward to today's discussions. It's clear that biodiversity and climate are inextricably linked so it's really great that we can explore today the issues that affect both of those areas um, to see how we can work in a complementary manner across both those agendas um, and to investigate further the role of subnational authorities across both areas. I'm really excited to hear from the perspective of our panel speakers uh, and for this to stimulate a sharing of experiences from all our 141 participants today uh, so that we can all improve uh, how we deliver for biodiversity and for our climate in the future. And so with that, I'll stop rambling and I'll hand you back to Juliet and the rest of our and panel speakers. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sue, for, for this uh, introduction and for presenting the whole process, which is really important indeed. Um, so I will first uh, present our panel today. Um, so, sorry. Um, so as you see, we have many, many speakers. We have eight speakers today. So first, thank you very much to all of you to, to be with us today, to take the time to share and to present uh, many different pers perspectives uh, on this topic of uh, interlinkages between biodiversity and climate. And so we have scientific perspectives, we have also multi-level governance perspectives, so I think it's, it's wonderful. And I'm really looking forward to, have, um, to hearing all of you today. Um, then, um, so today we have uh, with us Andy Purvis. Uh, Andy is a researcher at the Natural History Museum in London. Uh, Alexandra Dupré, who is my colleague and research fellow at IDRI, working on climate governance. Um, Emma Goodyear, who is uh, a program manager um, of the Peatlands program at IUCN in the UK. We also have uh, Roxanne Anderson, who is a research, uh, senior research fellow at the Environmental Research Institute. Uh, Emma and Roxanne will be presenting perspectives from Scotland. 
Uh, we will have perspectives from Brazil this time with M Miriam Garcia, who is a consultant uh, at the Atlantic Forest Great Reserve Initiatives. We will have uh, Costa Rica with us today with Andrea Mesa and uh, Rita Zagul. Uh, Andrea is a climate change director uh, of the Ministry of Energy and Environment in Costa Rica. And uh, Rita is the coordinator of the I Ambition Coalition for Nature and People. Uh, and finally, we'll have Clémentine Renevier, who is the head of the Biodiversity Bureau of the French Ministry uh, for uh, Ecological and uh, Inclusive Transition in France. And uh, I will be moderating the, um, the session and the Q&A at the end of the, of the presentations. Uh, I'm Juliette Landry, and I work as a research fellow at IBRI as well. So before... Um, Leaving the floor to our, to our panel, um, I would like to present um, a, the context and the objective of the webinar. Um, because why do we think interlinkages between climate and biodiversity uh, are essential to assess within the Eden Go process? Um, so the objective of the webinar is based on two well-known observations and thus uh, addresses a dual track approach. Um, the first one being that climate change and biodiversity loss are two interconnected crises and they are need to be addressed through a coordinated response. So we know that climate change is an important driver of biodiversity loss. We know that ecosystems play um, a major function in regulating uh, climate and that ecosystems are at the center of climate action. Um, but there are some solutions to uh, mitigate uh, climate change that can damage biodiversity, though, so there are trade-offs to be aware of. And um, we also know that climate change and biodiversity loss uh, share uh, root causes, uh, unsustainable mode of production and consumption, um, harmful subsidies, and so on. And to, do, to address those crises, we need a coordinated a response at both international uh, level but also uh, at national level and it's also necessary to involve subnational regional and local governments and to have multi-level interactions uh, because uh, the subnational level uh, implements and translates uh, strategies and action plans into realities and we can learn much from them and also multi-level governance can help in achieve this coherence and convergence of action between climate change and biodiversity. Um, so a few rules for today. Um, um, as I said earlier, please uh, keep your mic on, uh, on mute first uh, during the session. Uh, at the end of the presentations, you will have two possible ways of interaction with our speakers. Uh, you can use the conversation bar all along the webinar um, to share your questions, to share your comments. And uh, with my colleagues, we will try to, to read your questions and your comments and to, to gather them for the end of, the, of uh, our webinar. And uh, at the end of the session, you can also raise your hand to intervene and to directly ask your question or present your experience. Uh, but please be brief because we have, as you know, we have many speakers today. They will also be brief, so try to be brief for them and to ask your question in 30 seconds, Mike. Don't force me to cut your mic, please. <laughs> and um, so the program for today, uh, we divided this uh, webinar in three parts. Uh, we will have uh, global science-based perspectives first with uh, Andy and Alexandra. Um, then we will have um, uh, lessons from subnational and uh, local governments uh, when they implement natural natu natu based solutions for climate and biodiversity uh, with Scotland and Brazil. And then we will have finally um, the views from national governments with uh, Costa Rica and France uh, when we are talking about convergence of agendas uh, for climate change and biodiversity. So without further ado, uh, we would like to begin with the perspective from science, 
with uh, our first speaker, who is Andy Purvis. Um, Andy Purvis is a research leader and individual merit researcher at the Natural History Museum in London. Uh, he has been working on statistical modeling of specially compiled large data to answer uh, a wide range of questions in biodiversity science. Uh, he also has been a coordinating lead author on chapter two of the first IP-based global assessment of biodiversity and ecosystem services. So I will leave the floor to Andy first. Thanks very much indeed. Can you hear me all right? We didn't yes. really get a test. Great. Okay. So could I have these slides, please? Thank you. So I've been asked to give a, a, a rattle through from the biodiversity science perspective of linkages between climate and biodiversity. Uh, and so this is largely um, work from the IPBES global assessment that I was involved in and also has some results from the PREDICT project, which I lead. Uh, could I have the next slide, please? So as a framing device, I just want to um, draw your attention to this um, figure from Rayworth's book, Donut Economics, that shows clearly that we need to take some things from the planet. The planet can't just be left as a natural space because everybody alive and future generations too have the right to these things that they need for the social foundation, a decent quality of life, water, food, health, and so on. And so we have to produce those from the world. However, in order to ensure that we don't kill the goose that lays the golden egg, we have to produce those things without going through the ecological ceiling or the planetary boundaries that are these nine different parts of the global Earth system uh, that are listed in the, around the outer circle. And of these, climate change and biodiversity loss have been identified as the two core boundaries in Stefan et al's paper in 2015, uh, where they proposed the um, planetary boundaries framework. And th they're core boundaries because if you crash through either of those for any length of time, the rest will follow. So we have to keep on the, the right side of these planetary boundaries. So have we been? If I could have the next slide, please. It suggests strongly that we haven't. So the IPBES global assessment estimated that a million animal and plant species are currently threatened with extinction. And this is a very imprecise number because of the imprecision of the quantities we need. But it's certainly unprecedented in human history. So in order to know how many threatened species you've got, you need to know what fraction of species are threatened and how many. So first of all, what's showing there is the fraction that's threatened. And if you exclude insects, then across other animal and plant groups, it's typically about a quarter, 25% of species that are threatened with extinction. In insects, it's probably not quite as high as that, but there's plenty of evidence to suggest it's unlikely to be much below about 10%. Could I have the next um, reveal? Great, so then numbers of species, and again, this is less precise than we'd like. There isn't really a full complete list, but as far as we can tell, there's about two and a half million animal and plant species apart from insects. And there's around, we're less precise on this, five and a half million insect species. And so the last bit of the slide, please. So then we've simply got multiplication. There's a bit more than half a million non-insects, and there's a bit more than half a million insects. So at least a million animal and plant species currently threatened with extinction. Um, so could I have the oh, next slide, please? Sorry, was that a, a comment or question or something? No. Um, right, so we know where most of these threatened species live because biodiversity is distributed hugely unevenly across the Earth's surface. And climate is a big part of the reason why. Diversity is highest in highly productive, topographically complex environments. Highly productive, basically on land, means warm and wet, so the moist tropics. And in the ocean, it usually means 
warm and shallow, so coral reefs, for instance. So we have this belt of stupendously high diversity in the tropics and into the subtropics, and this is where most species and most threatened species are. Um, but also biodiversity in turn influences climate. So moist tropical forests create their own rain and the rain is necessary for the forest to persist. And so you have positive feedback loops between the ecosystem and the climate, which we are in danger of breaking. And it's not clear exactly where a tipping point, for instance, for Amazon dieback would be, but suggestions are that if you lose maybe 25% of the Amazon rainforest, then you might tip it away in, from rainforest into something more like savannah. Could we um, have the next slide, please? So biodiversity is distributed very unevenly and the threats are concentrated there, but the indirect drivers behind those threats can have their origins somewhere else. So here the circles show where in the world we get our soya beans from, or soya oil, or products derived from them like soya fed beef. And a total area of about 1.2 million hectares is used to grow the soya to feed UK demand. That would be about 20% of the UK's farmland. And that's just one crop. So basically international trade means we're importing goods from elsewhere and exporting damage to the habitats there. So it, we have to consider this action at a distance. Could I have the next slide, please? <coughs> right, biodiversity and climate, we'd be forgiven for thinking that climate change is actually the dominant driver of biodiversity loss, but the central panel here, uh, headed direct drivers, shows that actually climate change, which is the dark orange colour, is only the third or fourth most important direct driver of biodiversity loss. It comes a long way behind land and sea use change, which is most important on land and in freshwater, and direct exploitation, which is most important in marine. So climate change is increasing in importance, and within a few decades it might be as important as the big two, but we mustn't look for solutions to climate that exacerbate land use change, or we're not going to save biodiversity while conserving climate. Could we move on again, please? So land use change has already had a very serious impact on biodiversity. This is a map of uh, biodiversity in Tacnus Index, which estimates the fraction of originally present local biodiversity that remains. And basically, it's only the, the yellowest green areas that are within that sustainability donut. Everywhere that's got any kind of blue tinge, we've actually gone through the ecological ceiling. And the UK is in the bottom 10% of countries in the world. Um, we've been trashing um, our natural biodiversity for centuries. Um, so could we move on, please? So here, the trajectory on the left-hand side is showing the biodiversity in Tacnus Index through history, and the decline accelerates after the Industrial Revolution, basically as we start doing damage at a distance. Um, but in the 21st century, different scenarios give very different suggested trajectories. There is the opportunity for a green future, which is more sustainable. And that is something where green technologies are shared, where food calories switch towards more plant-based rather than animal-based diet, um, where there's uh, habitat restoration directed towards high conservation areas. And with that, you could undo 50 years worth of damage by the end of the century. And the only previous time we've undone 50 years worth of damage is in the latter half of the 14th century. And that's after the Black Death. So can I just have the last slide now, um, please? So biodiversity loss is driven by much more than just climate change. As this figure here from Wildlife Photographer of the Year shows elephants who've lost their habitat as it's been converted to oil palm plantation. 
but the solutions overlap and we have to look for solutions to the biodiversity crisis that have wins on the climate side and vice versa. Things like high carbon bioenergy plantations are not going to solve the biodiversity crisis. Thanks very much. Thank you, Andy. Uh, thank you for presenting striking evidence of uh, those interlinkages between climate change and biodiversity, and especially how climate is going to become an even more important driver for biodiversity loss. And not forget about those overlapping solutions. Thank you very much. Um, without further ado, I would like to present our next speaker. Uh, Alexandra Depré is a research fellow on uh, international climate governance at IDRI. She is responsible um, for the work on the Paris Agreement implementation and also climate biodiversity nexus. Uh, she was part of the negotiation team for Costa Rica during COP23 and COP24, and she has been working on uh, transparency frameworks, but also she has a background in uh, deforestation, uh, sustainability, sustainable food systems, and uh, biodiversity. Perfect. Thank you, Juliette, for the introduction and Andy for the presentation. So I'll be giving a complimentary presentation more from the climate perspective. So next slide, please. So my presentation, yes, will focus on this climate perspective. And as Andy described, climate change is really one of the main drivers of biodiversity loss. And the IPBES report, assessment reports how, notes how it will increase in importance in the future. So this really underscores the importance of responding ambitiously to climate change and achieving the Paris Agreement's goal of keeping temperature rise well below two degrees and even to 1.5 degrees. That being said, what is really key for biodiversity is how countries go about um, reaching that goal. Indeed, different greenhouse gas emission reduction pathways can be used to reach it, each representing a different combination of climate mitigation solutions, which can have either positive or negative impacts on biodiversity. And it's essential, therefore, to privilege those pathways that have positive impacts on biodiversity and minimize those who have negative impacts. So next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so to illustrate this, the different types of goal, um, emission reduction pathways, here are the four illustrative pathways to reach the 1.5 goal that are drawn from the IPCC's 1.5 special report. And if we look at the pathways that are titled P2 and P4, we can see that in the P2 scenario, that the more mit climate mitigation we carry out now, the less relative efforts we are needed in latter decades, and vice versa for P4. Because in P2, basically the steep emission drop in the next two decades is a result of ambitious and drastic energy system decarbonization, so that means shifting from fossil fuels to renewable energy, and a reduction in energy consumption, so that's a great part. In brown, you can see that it also is an increase in terrestrial carbon stocks, and that includes through different sorts of nature-based solutions. And given these efforts, there's less need in the decades of 2040 and 2050 to recur to carbon dioxide removals or negative emissions, notably by BECs. So BECs, or bioenergy carbon capture and storage, for those who might not be familiar, refers to bioenergy who, whose emissions result the emissions resulting from the energy combustion are captured and buried underground. This technology does not, is not yet operational and there's controversy around even its climate benefits, yet different countries, including the UK, are already including it in their carbon neutrality plans because it allows to go have negative emissions. So as you see in the P4 scenario, the relative lack of efforts right now is therefore compensated in latter decades by a very large use of BECs. So next slide, please. And you may be wondering, why is this so important? Well, the reason is that very large scale BECs deployment is projected to have highly negative impacts on biodiversity, given that it implies the use of very large scale production of bioenergy crops. And to give you a sense of the scale, in the P4 scenario projects that in 2050, 30% of global agricultural land 
would be used for bioenergy crops. So this is the size of India. And in contrast, in P2, this um, amount would only be 7%. And according to the IPCC's um, special report on land use, this very widespread use of BECs would raise the number of food insecure people by 150 million due to bioenergy production encroaching on subsistence agricultural land. And while the IPCC and IPBES have not yet conducted a precise analysis on the impact of this widespread BEX on biodiversity, the current reports when we cross them, which is what we did at IDRI last year, um, already and other scientific reports already in indicate that this impact would be really negative. First of all, not only would these bioenergy crops perhaps use a lot of pesticides, and as projected by IBES, would likely be monocultures. But more importantly, it would also result in major land use transformations and tensions, as agriculture would likely need to expand and therefore encroach upon natural lands. And these tensions are projected to be particularly um, strong in the tropics, where bioenergy crops grow faster, but also where there are, of course, more biodiversity hotspots, as Andy pointed out. And so one study in 2016 showed that half of the potential bioenergy production areas situated in biodiversity hotspots, while another study in 2018 identified Central America, Southwestern South America, including the Atlantic Forest, so the two areas we will hear from in a bit, as particularly at risk for these tensions. So in our view, really what this means is that two things. First, that nature-based solutions deployed today could really be at risk in coming decades if in coming decades there's this need for, for a lot of land to grow energy crops. And this really shows the importance of shifting the world towards a climate reduction pathway that is closer to P2 than to P4. So next, next slide, please. So all of this is what we really put together when we were uh, researching an EDRI paper we published in November in which this is the infographic that we, that we produced, so in which we crossed the IPCC, IPBIS, and other scientific reports. And we really tried to look at what would be the different positive or negative biodiversity impacts of different climate mitigation solutions that are part of these emission pathways. And so just to reiterate, basically, on the right hand, the P2 type pathway maximizes biodiversity and climate synergies by first of all, decarbonizing the energy system as fast as possible by mainstreaming nature-based solutions. So that's in the part that is mentioned absolute, so the land use, and by, min by, and by reducing energy and resource consumption. And in, in contrast, it also minimizes the use of VEX. So this is why, in our view, while the, the, the synergy of nature-based solutions is nature-based solutions are seen as the most visible and immediate climate and biodiversity synergy, it's truly important to also have the bigger picture and understand the importance of reducing emissions from the energy system today. And so next and final slide, please. So of course, this means this has a lot of different policy implications, and we'll hear more from um, our speakers in the last section, but I wanted to just um, point out three things that stood out to me. First, that subnational governments and entities are really key in this process. Not only are they key in implementing nature-based solutions, for example, but it's also they who will be most directly confronted to these land use conflicts and um, between, say, conservation and bioenergy crops or agriculture. And so it's at this level also that place-based, con context-specific solutions can be found that can then be um, put in context with the national governments. And at the national level, it seems really important to me for governments not only to coordinate climate and biodiversity policies today, but also to really keep in mind the 2050 and longer term horizons so that we understand what are the impacts of say climate policies today on biodiversity in the future. And then finally, at the international level, it seems essential to promote greater synergies between the three Rio conventions but really with the aim to support better national and subnational coordination. And to conclude, it's also really why, in the light of the context of the COVID-19 crisis, it's essential that resilient economic recovery plans be put in place that include ambitious climate action today, 
so that we do not walk in the world onto a pathway that would require significant vex use in the future if we want to reach the protocol. And so, yes, so I'll just end with saying that at IDRI, we're looking into these policy implications, so we're very interested in, in discussing with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Uh, so, so thank you, Andy, Alexandra, for this really interesting presentations on the opportunities for linking those two prices, but also the risks that they raise and are important to, to present. Um, and you have done a great transition to, to our second part, Alexandra, with the uh, mention of subnational governments being at the, at the key of the process to, to implement nature-based solutions and what we can actually learn from them and uh, what are their role um, to, to, to link those two prices. So uh, let's begin with, uh, with Scotland, uh, lessons from Scotland with um, uh, a dual presentation by, by Emma Goodyear and Roxanne Anderson. Uh, Emma is a program manager. She's uh, the manager of the Pitlands manager at uh, IUCN in the UK. Uh, she has been studying uh, Pitlands ecosystems for a PhD. Uh, and she works, she works also as a wetland ecologist uh, for the Scotland's environmental regulator. Uh, Roxanne, uh, she is a senior research fellow at the Environmental Research Institute, uh, which is part of the University of the Islands and Islands, where she leads the Carbon, Water and Climate team. Uh, and she chairs the Scotland's National Peatland Research and Monitoring Group, and also coordinates the Flow Country Research Hub, uh, which is a network uh, of uh, many stakeholders and institutions involved in peatland research uh, in Scotland. So thank you very much. We are really happy to have you both today presenting Scotland case. I will I'll leave the floor to you. Great, thank you very much, Juliet. Can I have the first slide, please? So Roxanne and I are gonna give a short overview of the work that's happening in Scotland on implementing peatland conservation and restoration as a nature-based solution for both climate and biodiversity. If I could have my first slide, please. So peatlands support an array of unique biodiversity and the really sort of harsh wetland conditions and the acidic and nutrient poor environment of our peat bogs, especially in the UK when we consider our acidic sort of blanket bogs and raised bogs, really encourages a range of adaptations to allow organisms to survive there. Now I have to confess that peatlands aren't the most biodiverse habitats on earth, but they do contain a range of highly specialised plants and animals that can be found nowhere else. And because of this, the maintenance and conservation of habitat extent, habitat networks, and ecosystem conditions is crucial to conserving these species. Over 20% of Scotland's land area is peatland, and Scottish peatlands are estimated to store at least the equivalent of 140 years worth of Scottish greenhouse gas emissions, which is locked away in the carbon rich peat soil. It's estimated that around 80% of Scotland's peatlands are in a damaged condition as a result of widespread drainage for agricultural improvement, forestry plantations, overgrazing and fire. Restoration of these damaged peatlands brings with it multiple wins for biodiversity. The recovery of key peatland species helping to meet biodiversity objectives to protect and enhance the species and habitats whilst delivering multiple wins for climate mitigation, enhancing water quality and preserving historic and environmental archives. I can have my next slide, please. So Scotland really has been leading the way in the UK for the delivery of peatland restoration. And the Scottish model of restoration um, has been replicated across the UK and also in some European countries due to its strong strategic approach and success in its delivery. So in 2015, the Scottish Government Conservation Agency, Scottish Natural Heritage, produced a national peatland plan and its approach has really been mirrored in the overarching uh, UK national peatland strategy. Next slide please. And following that a suite of policy measures for biodiversity, water and climate have then provided a really strong target for improving peatland condition. So this is currently strongly underpinned by Scotland's 2020 challenge for biodiversity and then also the 2018 climate change plan which commits the government to delivering 250,000 hectares of peatland restoration over the next 10 years. Next slide, please. 
And then the restoration itself is being coordinated and delivered by a government-led programme called Peatland Action, which places regional advisors across the country to help sort of guide restoration planning and also guide, guide the delivery on the ground, sort of helping contractors to scope out projects and see projects through. So over 200 projects have been delivered to date nationally through Peatland Action, and this is in addition to an already extensive number of restoration projects which have been funded through European Life Funding, Heritage Lottery Fund, and other agri-environment scheme funding pots. Next slide, please. But really the key to all of this is that the policy that exists and the strong strategy is linked to a long-term funding commitment now from Scottish Government, which helps to build expertise and capacity within the peatland community to allow this delivery of habitat restoration at the national scale. So the funding is also linked to a strong research and monitoring initiative which helps to aid development of novel restoration techniques and also to further aid scientific understanding. So I'd just like to hang on to the next slide and hand over to Roxanne. Thank you Emma. So if we get on this slide, so at, at the Scottish level uh, one of the key elements of the integration of the science and the policy together as well along with the government is the responsibility of the national uh, research people in research and monitoring group this is a group i chair the group is made up of a number of academic from both uh, universities and, and and researchers from non-academic backgrounds but also a representative of key government agencies and that enables because we're all sitting at the same table it enables a direct link from the science to the policy so it really underpins the delivery of this plan and what aside from all the individual members own commitment in, in the research the key role of this group is really to scrutinize any piece of evidence that is is brought forward and the ongoing research activities and make sure that these are fed into the national uh, strategic uh, objectives we also review and feedback on current policy briefs and report that summarize these evidence to make sure that the key messages are clear transparent and accessible readily Finally, we support the decision making about core national research infrastructure, for example, in, in the monitoring of greenhouse gases where large infrastructure can be bought and we help decide where it would be best located uh, with a strategic overview of the current activities and planned activities. If I could have the next slide, please. Um, the, as well as the subnational level, this is also exemplified um, in, in the kind of regional level. And one key example of this is the Flow Country Research Hub. The Flow Country, for those of you who are not familiar, is the largest expanse of blanket bog in Europe and arguably in the world. And blanket bogs are a particular type of, peat, uh, of peatland that are globally rare. It is therefore a site of global significance for its biodiversity, but it also happens to be the single largest UK soil store. Um, holding an equivalent to five times as much as the, the whole of the forestry in the UK. So 400 million tonnes of carbon are estimated to be stored in the peat in the full country. And therefore protecting and conserving, but also restoring the full country where it has been um, damaged in the past through afforestation or drainage is, is a really important um, goal if we want to uh, achieve this dual ambition of enhancing biodiversity but also meeting climate targets. Um, so the Flow Country Research Hub really the role of this research has been to coordinate and make sure that all the research that is taking place is communicated, integrated in the best way possible to make sure that we have infrastructure that can sustain a world-class research and that we can integrate that research with the needs of the landowners, the practitioners, the governance bodies but all the policy makers to make sure that we help deliver these restoration objectives and conservation object objectives. And ultimately, one of the, the, the important role of the, the Flow Country Research Hub is to make that research accessible through outreach, knowledge exchange activities, and also to support um, the, the, the next big step for the Flow Country, which is the nomination for the UNESCO World Heritage Site. There are currently in the world no uh, heritage UNESCO World Heritage Sites that, that are designated solely because they are a peatland. So if Scotland was able to achieve this, to get the UNESCO to recognise the, 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 the global value of this particular peatland in the north of Scotland, it would be a very big message to the world that um, preserving and, and, and uh, restoring those habitats is not only going to help us meet those uh, biodiversity target, but will also uh, help us with, with the current 
uh, ambition to reduce our net greenhouse gas emissions. So these are kind of examples of how in Scotland we've integrated all the, right the, the way from the kind of local research all the way to the national strategic objective uh, by integrating those three strands of governance, uh, practical application on the ground and research uh, in parallel. And, and that's my, my conclusion here. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emma and Roxanne. It was really, really wonderful to see such initiatives going on in Scotland on peatlands and how, uh, as you said, you are uh, interacting with uh, researchers, but also governance bodies and, and so on. Uh, really, really great example. Um, uh, since we don't have much time, I will directly uh, uh, leave the floor to Miriam Garcia. Uh, she is from Brazil. She is a consultant for the Atlantic Forest Great Reserve Initiative uh, at the Wildlife Research and Environmental Education Institute. Uh, she is a PhD candidate in international relations, and she has been uh, she has a great many years of experience uh, on international relations and environmental studies. I leave the floor to Miriam now. Thank you. Hello, thank you. Good morning for a few of you. Good afternoon for the others. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, both the Scottish government and IDRI for inviting SPVS to present uh, its case of the Atlantic Forest Great Reserve Initiative. I think uh, among all the incertitudes this pandemic imposes on a global scale, there is one certitude that is very reassuring, at least for the environmentalists that social and economical recovery shall be built in own ecological principles. This is because, as we already seen in this webinar, science-based evidence shows us that human well-being and health ecosystem are connected. Next slide, please. So, in this view, nature-based solutions are a key component of green recovery. And most importantly, uh, nature-based solutions should be on the toolkit of every local authority around the globe, not only as a public policy option, but also as an option to team up with civil society organizations and private sector representative as the Atlantic Forest Initiative. NBS is a relative new concept. However, there is some agreement about its principles. Uh, IUCN supports that nature-based solutions should be anchored on aid principles. For instance, principle three states that nature-based solutions are determined by site-specific natural and cultural context. Uh, very recently, a few weeks ago, a manifesto defending that uh, nature-based solutions should answer the challenges from both a climate and biodiversity agenda has been published. This manifest advances that nature-based solutions should be anchored on four principles. The first is that nature-based solutions should be powerful tools to capture carbon from the atmosphere. Second, Nature-based solutions should also conserve and protect existing ecosystems and engage with local communities and indigenous people and, of course, be rigorous on its ecological principles. The Atlantic Forest Great Reserve Initiative complies with IUCN principles and these four principles. But before explaining the initiative here in Brazil, I would like, you, I would like to give you some background information about the Atlantic Forest. Next slide, please. So Brazil is internationally recognized for the Amazon rainforest, but it also comprises biomes such as the Atlantic Forest that is located alongside the Brazilian coast. It is estimated that 70% of the Brazilian population lives in the Atlantic Forest, which represents around 120 million people. Urban occupation is certainly one of the main drivers for this biome deforestation. Currently, only 7% of forest remains in a good conservation status. Even in this challenging scenario, the Atlantic forest has a high rate of species endemism, such as the fact that 95% of the reptiles are endemic to the Atlantic forest. The biome also comprises Brazilian cultural and historical heritage sites. Uh, next slide, please. 
And I said that the Atlantic Forest uh, used to cover a large portion of the Brazilian coast. Currently, the largest remaining area of this bioma is located alongside the three Brazilian states, Santa Catarina, Paraná, and Sao Paulo. The map shows these three states and it is exactly the intervention area of the Atlantic Forest Great Reserve Initiative. Next one, please. Uh, but how can the Atlantic Forest Great Reserve Initiative be defined? SPVS, which is the organization that I represent, is a Brazilian uh, civil society organization working on the Paraná State portion of the Atlantic Forest for over 35 years. The Atlantic Forest Great Reserve Initiative acts as an umbrella framework structure providing vision and strategies for the implementation of actions in these 2 million hectares. SPVS saw the opportunity to scale up actions by team up with civil society actors as well as other actors such as local authorities engaged in the implementation of nature-based solutions. Nature-based solutions are essential to ensure resilient cities in this area and the conservation of natural areas are providers of ecosystem services for large cities such as Sao Paulo and Curitiba, but also for local communities. Next one, please. Multi-stakeholders partnerships for implementing nature-based solutions are even more relevant for countries that have a decentralized environmental policies, which is the case for Brazil. In Brazil, at the state level, there are environmental enforcement agencies and municipalities can also rule aspects of the legal environmental framework, such as the establishment of public protected areas and implementation of payment for ecosystem service programs. The Atlantic Forest Great Reserve Initiative encompasses three states and 46 municipalities. Uh, we have been formally establishing partnerships with municipalities and state environmental enforcement agencies for actions such as patrolling within public protected areas, species conservation programs, and promotion of ecotourism activities. SPVS is also advocating for full implementation of tax transfers policies benefiting municipalities with a higher rate of protected areas within their territories, which is a mechanism uh, that is very local in Brazil. SPVS is also providing capacity building sessions for small municipalities and uh, public servants and local authorities regarding environmental thematics, including the implementation of uh, nature-based solutions. Uh, next one, please. The Atlantic Forest Great Reserve Initiative demonstrated the importance of bringing together multi-stakeholder coalitions to implementing ambitious nature-based solutions. Bringing together civil society and organizations and local authority has been a key uh, to, to face the challenges that we have here at Atlantic Forest. And finally, an next slide. I would like uh, to invite you to check our social media account for more information about the initiative, such as a series of videos on your YouTube channel showing the beauties of the Atlantic Forest. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was really interesting to see this great initiative, uh, which is the Atlantic Forest Great Reserve, and what you do to, to, to foster nature-based solution in such a complicated, uh, area with three different regions <laughs> it's really great to see that um i will try to be quick and move on to the, the last part uh, with the views from the national government this time uh, on the how we can make uh, converge those two agendas uh, which are climate change agenda and biodiversity loss agenda uh, we will begin with uh, views from uh, costa rica with uh, Andrea Mesa. Andrea Mesa is the climate change director of the Ministry for Energy and Environment in Costa Rica. Uh, she coordinates the implementation of the NDC and uh, she has been leading the negotiation with different sectoral ministries um, and other, other subnational governments and non-state actors and so on. And then we will hear uh, Rita El Zagrul. Uh, she is the coordinator uh, and Costa Rica's focal point for the I Ambition Coalition for Nature and People. 
um, and she um, she's working uh, to uh, for this network to achieve an ambitious deal uh, of the CBD uh, for both uh, biodiversity and uh, humanity survival. So I will just leave the floor to Andre Andrea and uh, Rita right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone and good morning, good, good evening. Um, thank you to Idri and the Scottish government for this invitation. We're very honored to be participating um, in this Edinburgh process um, and webinars. And um, yes, as, as Costa Rican government and, and with our um, minister, Minister Rodriguez, who is calling himself a, a conservationist, uh, we're very committed with this idea of how to reinforce the link between the Rio conventions and particularly between the biodiversity and climate change conventions. Um, we're very clear as a country that this is a main element if we want to achieve the climate Paris goals. We know that nature-based solutions represent 30% of the climate solutions but we are also seeing very big challenges that uh, we are only receiving around less than 3% of the climate finance. So um, for this reason, we've been at the national level, but also at the international level, um, generating consistency in our policies, in our political commitments, and we are trying to see how to include this integrated approach at the national level, subnational level, but also how to promote this integrated approach at the international level. So I will address more elements around the national level, and then we'll leave the floor to Rita to talk more about what's our position at the international level in this negotiation of the post-2020 framework. Next slide, please. So as a first element um, that I would like to, to bring is that we just uh, submitted and published our long-term strategy a year ago to become a net zero emission economy in 2050. And in, in this uh, strategy, we define uh, several measures on how to do this transformation of the economy. And if you pay attention to the focus areas, to focus areas 8, 9, and 10, we are basically seeing and establishing concrete measures on how to do this transformation. And we are uh, having a specific measures on nature-based solutions. Um, we have a concrete milestone or target of having 60% of the territory uh, covered with forest. Uh, and we are very committed with this kind of approach because we have been receiving a lot of social economic benefits from, from these elements. Uh, 20 years ago, we um, created a tax on fossil fuels, and part of this uh, tax are channeled to the National Forest Financing Fund, or FONAFIFO. And through this fund, we have been able to protect more than 1 million hectares in the country under a, a scheme of payment of environmental services program. The, the interesting part of this is that we are recognizing these uh, ecological services that the forest is providing to the society and uh, we've been managed to support more than 50,000 families in the rural areas and, and translate more than 400 million um, dollars to these rural areas and around 60 million do dollars to the indigenous territories and I will say that right now in this post-COVID situation with vulnerable communities this element is, is critical and we want to address and continue with this kind of integrated elements. And it's right now one of the things that we're working on with the Ministry of Agriculture, with the Ministry of Planning, on how to really incorporate these stimulus packages uh, uh, to be aligned with this kind of vision. Next, please. The other element is, next slide, please is that we're working right now in the enhancement of our NDC. Well, our goal is to present it this year, and it will be aligned with our, our long-term strategy and with aligned with our adaptation policy. And what we are working on right now is to also put nature-based solutions as a backbone of this enhanced NDC 
and to have concrete measures, not only related to forests, but to the protection of mangroves, to oceans, and to other critical ecosystems. We really want to see and are very clear that it will be uh, a critical area if we want to also have uh, a just transition approach on this element because at the end, uh, ecosystems, they are critical also to guarantee livelihoods in some very vulnerable communities and territories. Next, please. The, the other element that I would like to share with you is it's how from the national level, we are also developing some um, tools to engage local governments um, in the participation of this whole decarbonization process. And when we developed what we called our carbon neutrality program um, that uh, provides a mechanism for the management of GHG emissions, for organizations, we started just with private organizations in the beginning, but two years ago, we adequated the program and we started also with communities. Next, please. So right now, what we are doing is that as part of the, of the program, we have been able to include and to promote the participation of different local governments. Next, please. And the response to the to the program has been uh, extraordinarily interesting. Uh, we first developed the methodology on how to do this measurement of GAG emissions at the territorial level, at the municipality level. Next, please. But we have also been developing guides on the kind of actions that um, local governments can do. And one interesting element is that we just finished a survey to try to identify actions that the local governments are doing. And it is very interesting to see a lot of activities that they're doing to protect and conserve nature or to use nature as infrastructure. So we think that um, this uh, really shows the commitment that we have from local governments. Next, please. And um, right now we have more than 23 municipalities. Next, because I'm almost over time. I will be very fast in this part just to uh, share with you that there is a methodology that we have some information about the inventories and that once that local governments have their inventories, they're developing their plans on how to reduce emissions. And they're also using a lot of nature-based solutions approach to do this. Next, please. Um, next. And just to, to let you know that we have, it is a pilot phase that we are right now with the participation of 23 um, municipalities. Next, please. And this has really um, shared a lot of good lessons. And once we have these and the plans and we see the, the actions they're doing, we give them a recognition. And this kind of voluntary approach has been very successful. Next, please. This is just some of the, this is my, my this program has also allowed us um, to also channel around $1 million for, for the FONA FIFO as well, because for example, the companies that are participating in the program, when they need to compensate, they go and, and purchase UCCs, uh, the Costa Rican carbon units. And, and basically most of these carbon units are coming from the FONA FIFO. And I will leave the presentation here and, and give the floor to Rita to continue and give more of what's our integrated approach at the international level. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. And um, good afternoon, everyone. I wish to start by thanking the Scottish government and Idri for organizing this webinar. Um, after uh, listening to Andrea's presentation, and as was mentioned before, I will be um, giving uh, sh and sharing with you the efforts undertaken by Costa Rica on an international level, uh, more specifically with the High Ambition Coalition for Nature and People. Can I have the next slide, please? 
So the High Ambition Coalition for Nature and People, uh, it is an interregional group of countries led by Costa Rica and France, um, established to achieve an ambitious deal at the CBD. Uh, it also promotes uh, the integral role that additional terrestrial and marine protection play um, in any strategy to, su to um, successfully achieve the Paris Agreement's goal. Next slide, please. So um, the coalition was first presented uh, by the president of Costa Rica last year during the United Nations uh, Climate Summit in New York. And uh, it was created precisely to tackle both climate and biodiversity crisis. The central goal of the coalition uh, is to protect 30% of the planning. And uh, with this, we mean 30% of land and 30% of ocean by 2030. Also, uh, the coalition aims to unlock the full potential of nature and climate actions by promoting nature-based solution within the UNFCCC. As was mentioned by uh, previous speakers, the links between climate and biodiversity is strong and uh, threats are mutually reinforcing. As the destruction of ecosystem exacerbates climate change and the latter also accelerates the extinction of species. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the coalition was created to tackle climate and biodiversity crisis. And one of um, the participants was asking precisely the link between also the current situation with uh, the health crisis. Uh, we have seen that um, many research are supporting the importance of protecting nature in order to prevent uh, spillover that, trig that, tri that are triggered by disruptive interaction with nature and that could lead to future pandemics. So we can even see the importance of protecting nature uh, even within the health uh, crisis that we are currently facing. Opportunities to address these crises are time bound. Next slide, please. With regard to the central goal of the coalition, it is important to take into account, and it's very important for all the members, um, that having the target of the 30% is not only a quantitative target, but it, also, it is also a qualitative one. Uh, we believe that the target should focus on the most important areas for biodiversity, and the resulting network of, of conserved areas should be ecologically representative, well-connected, and should maintain uh, species diversity and abundance. Another key element, and it was also mentioned by uh, Andrea's presentation, is uh, the respect for indigenous people's rights and the promotion of indigenous-led conservation. Indigenous people must be central partners in the development and the implementation of the new spatial target. To date, uh, the High Ambition Coalition for Nature and People has over 25 members, and I'm glad to share with you that our membership continues to grow. Even though it is unsure when the CBD or the COP26 will take place, um, with the world currently facing an unparalleled health crisis, intrinsically linked to our environment and the wildlife within it, we believe that the coalition's work is more timely than ever. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrea and Rita. Uh, I'm not going to, to be long because uh, I think we don't have a lot of time now. So let's go directly to Clémentine. Uh, Clémentine is the head of uh, Biodiversity, Forest and Ocean at the International Directorate of the French Ministry for the Ecological and Inclusive Transition. Uh, she is uh, part of the biodiversity negotiation, but she also has experience in uh, climate negotiation. So I, I will leave the floor to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to to Idri and, and the Edinburgh process to, for the invitation and also for, for the previous presentation, uh, which were really interesting. Um, and yeah, also thank uh, Rita for presenting the, the high ambition coalition that we are piloting uh, together. So <clears throat> um, I will first um, do a, an overview of the, of the international agenda on biodiversity and climate. As you might know, uh, for uh, obvious reasons, there are still many uncertainties around the in, in, an upcoming climate and biodiversity agenda. Um, so the IUCN Congress uh, was originally planned in June this year in Marseille, but it's postponed to January next year. Uh, France has still a strong, strong will to replicate uh, the initial ambition and organization of this event uh, next January, if, if there are circumstances uh, allow it. Uh, all the IUCN processing have been postponed accordingly. Uh, for example, the, the online vote of the motions will take place uh, in October. 
and some of the motions uh, that that France is um, is uh, co-authoring uh, are directly linked to to the topic today of the link between climate and biodiversity and also nature-based solutions. Um, and France is still aiming to to have a summit of head of states and governments at the IUCN Congress. Um, and the summits uh, of business leaders and local authorities are, are still planned as well. So other important milestone for this uh, international biodiversity um, uh, calendar this, uh, this year and next year are the, the CDB process, of course. So there will be the CDB intercession. They are still planning in August this year. Uh, but uh, the calendar might, might shift also due to, to, to the current circumstances. Um, but there will be also the, the, nature, the nature summits uh, in New York so, so, uh, um, in September uh, on the margin of the, of the UN uh, General Assembly. Uh, there will also be the UNFCCC intercession in October on the climate side. And then we will have uh, the, the third uh, open-ended working group uh, for the negotiation of the post-2020 um, global biodiversity framework. The, the date for COP15 um, and for COP20, so COP15 for biodiversity and COP26 for, for climate are still uh, pending. Uh, so um, they, they, they are very likely to, to be postponed to 2021. So there is a possibility to make 2021 the super year for climate and biodiversity. Uh, with the delivery of updated uh, national uh, determined contributions on the climate side, uh, climate long-term strategies, and the adoption of a post-2020 global biodiversity framework, and uh, also new uh, national biodiversity strategies and action plan. So next, pli next slide, please. Um, however, uh, 2020 is not what we call lost year for, for biodiversity and climate, and we can still be working to oper operationalize uh, this biodiversity and climate conversions also this year. Um, so there is a strong link um, between biodiversity and climate uh, agendas um, that we will have to do in order to have a coordinated policy action in these two fields. So the, I think the, the COVID-19 crisis is showing that doing this conversion is more timely and important than ever. Uh, as Rita said also, uh, we are in a crisis that is directly linked to the erosion of, and, and of biodiversity and the overexploitation of biodiversity. And in addition, climate change might also exacerbate uh, habitat destructions and um, a risk of, of zoonosis. So we need to make wise use of the window of opportunity that is given to us uh, and tackle both issues in an integrated manner. For example, by making sure that uh, we invest in green economy, green infrastructure, natural-based solutions, and not subsidizing projects that are harmful to climate change uh, and, and to biodiversity. Many solutions exist and we need a strategic and integrated views as long as, long as a strong political commitment to ensure that the most relevant uh, um, actions will be will be implemented. So the coverages between climate and biodiversity policies can be made at several levels. First of all, conversion could be strongly underlined through political appeals and statements calling for joint work. So this political impetus can take the form of decision of COP15 of the CDB or COP26 of the of the UNFCCC that would stress the importance of linking their work. So we strongly welcome the UK Climate uh, COP presidency to put biodiversity at the, at the COP26 agenda. Other arenas can also be used, as, um, as I was mentioning, the, the UN General Assembly, but also the, the G20 uh, or the, the high-level uh, political forum on, on the Sustainable Development Goals or bilateral declaration, uh, as you might have read, the, the Beijing Declaration between France and China that also tackled this, uh, this issue. So um, there was also, um, um, I mean, action to, to, to take the, at the science level. So joint work between the IBES and the IPCC could also favor uh, these political conversions by scientifically strengthening the message. 
Um, as you might know, they a workshop on biodiversity and climate change co-sponsored by IPES and the IPCC should have been held uh, in May this year, uh, but um, which would have results in, in a special workshop report available for COP15 and COP26. Uh, it has been postponed, but it's still a very important, uh, a very important um, uh, event uh, for, for us. At the expert level, we can ask both conventions the CDB and the UNFCCC to mainstream biodiversity and climate in their program of work. For instance, in the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, that will be our framework for action in the next decade uh, on biodiversity, France and the EU are pushing for an ambitious language uh, on targets and indicators relating to climate change and nature-based solutions, so the target six and nine. Um, and also joint working groups between the two conventions um, uh, can also be a, a solution to, to explore. For the national level, uh, we must explicitly refer to biodiversity and climate change convergence in our national strategy, such uh, uh, as uh, our NDC and our, our NDSAP, and also in the, in the national strategies that we, that we developed. <clears throat> um, also natural-based solutions, and ecosystem-based approaches for climate are tools to, to implement this conversion that was already uh, presented by, by uh, the Atlantic Initiative in a very uh, operationalized uh, manner. So they give greater visibility to multifunctional responses in which ecosystem help reduce the impact of climate change. For example, uh, as was also shown, forests can store large amounts of carbons, um, uh, as well as mangroves and, and peatland, also as was presented by by, um, by the, the Scottish uh, government. Um, it is just a question of using nature, not as a constraint, but as a solution to various uh, problems. For example, green spaces in cities can help uh, fight the urban heat uh, island effect or reduce runoff and the risk of pollution of water courses. So, as you might know, <clears throat> France is submitting uh, two motions that I was referring to uh, for, for the IUCN on agroecology as a natural based solutions and uh, on the link between climate and biodiversity. And as Rita presented, we are also co piloting the, the HAC, the High Ambition Coalition for Nature and People, uh, that which aims at protecting 30% of the planet, uh, which is also for us natural-based solutions for climate and biodiversity. And maybe at last, finance is frequently mentioned as a major tool to enable biodiversity and climate link to become operationalized by, via the financing of solutions that will bring benefits for both the fights against climate change and the protection of ecosystem. And this mobilization of resources, both, both public and private, is key for the success of the post-2020 framework and its future implementation. So next and last slide, please. <laughs> I'll try to, to, to be quick. Um, so on the importance of local and regional governments uh, in implementing the, the climate and biodiversity convergence. Um, so as you all uh, aware, uh, an important part of the policies to tackle climate change and or biodiversity are actually implemented at the local level uh, by local actor. So there are crucial partners um, and they are the one implementing the solution on the ground. In France, uh, this imperative is even bigger as we have a large uh, territory that is composed of rich and diverse ecosystems, especially in, a, in the overseas department and territories. Um, the administrative uh, level that has the competency are in France, the regions and the city. And in France, in the case of our uh, biodiversity law, uh, it enables them to innovate in the implementation of the public policy with the setting up of regional biodiversity agencies. With this new partnership dynamic, we are moving toward a tailored approach uh, that offers solutions to regional stakeholders to adapt the implementation of the policy and the better coordination. In addition, uh, France is in the process of the drafting its new NDSAP, so its new uh, National Biodiversity Strategy. And a series of local workshops will be organized with local actors where they will have the possibility to give feedbacks and start the discussion uh, on the implementation. 
So coming back to the international scale, and we, I will finish with that, is it for us essential to have a strong representation of local actors' uh, messages in the CDB in order to hear their message for the post-2020 framework and how they are planning to mobilize for helping its implementation. Adding strong and coordinate climate and biodiversity action agendas can also be a powerful tool to ensure integrated mainstreaming by actors that are working on the ground, uh, such as civil society, local NGOs, businesses, etc. So I thank you again, and uh, yeah, I'm ready for a question if we still have a bit of time and uh, if there are some. Thank you. Thank you, Clementine. So yeah, as you may notice, we have been really ambitious with the scheduled stay. <laughs> and because we wanted many speakers representing many perspectives, but um, the content is here. So we are super, super happy about that. Um, thank you to all the speakers. It was highly instructive to hear your presentations. And there have been uh, quite a lot of reactions and questions. So one, first, I wanted to ask you if you can stay for 10 more minutes. Uh, till 40 and um, 640 if it's okay with you so we can have this dialogue with our, our participants and um and okay so if you are if you're okay with that i will just uh keep on with sorry the questions um um first um there have been some questions about the convergence of the Rio conventions uh, and how to better uh, integrate the biodiversity loss uh, impacts uh, in in the strategy in the climate strategies and um, and the opposite way around. So um, maybe the first question we can ask is on your perspective: What are the your main expectations from the COP15 for biodiversity and COP26 for climate? Uh, what are your expectations of the results that could better uh, that could enhance this convergence of uh, agendas. Uh, I wanted first to ask the questions um, to Andy and Alexandra to have the, the, their scientific uh, perspectives on that, if, if, you, if you're okay with that. Andy or Alexandra? There we go. Right. Um, yeah, so it's a great question. I think if we are to achieve the sorts of change that we need to, then it's important to have not a single target, however ambitious, but a range of mutually reinforcing targets. So 30% by 2030, great that can secure the future of lots of threatened species, but we also need to consider the state of ecosystems and biodiversity away from those hotspots, because we need e ecosystems that can work for us. We need the peatlands to continue to store their carbon. We need seagrass meadows to grow rather than shrink as they have been doing. So I think that we, we have to have a, a set of mutually beneficial targets such that, and, and also set actions that are synergistic, benefiting multiple targets. The trouble with any target is that any target can be cheated. And so you can achieve the target at face value, but miss the point. And we simply cannot afford for that to happen. So having a bunch of interlocked targets, I think is probably the best safeguard against that. Looking for the win-wins, things where biodiversity and climate are benefited by the same actions. Um, I would just add to this very clear intervention by Andy, thank you. Um, I perhaps not very specific things, but I think the I would really insist also on the this important of, of thinking not just about what we need to do now, but also taking into account the longer term. And of course, as many of you know, 2020 is also the year where countries for the Paris Agreement invites um, all states to 
present their long-term strategies. And so how do these long-term strategies, I mean, this is a new exercise for countries, so presumably it won't necessarily take into account what are the impacts on biodiversity, but um, crossing eventually, I mean, starting at COP26 and COP25, um, ways to cross in the future the long-term strategies, the NDCs and the MBSAPs in different ways would be would be helpful. And and again, um, this is this is work we're going to be doing at Idri, and we'll be publishing a paper on this, but um, still have to do some more research. So thank you. Thank you, Andy and Alexandra. Really interesting points being made here about uh, interlocked targets and and the long-term strategies. Uh, I, I would like to go to the straight to the point and ask uh, our subnational uh, this representative from subnational uh, level here to to say what they expect from those big meetings and those landmarks for biodiversity and climate and how how they could be better integrated into this process and yeah uh, so if so someone from Scotland or Brazil uh, could could say what they are expecting from those uh, meetings. Hello. Hi. Um, I think that we saw a very interesting process with uh, the Lima Paris Action Agenda and the NASCA in the run-up uh, for the Paris, uh, for the COP Paris and the Paris Agreement. And I think it's very interesting to see how civil society and local authorities can build the coalitions with uh, targets. And uh, of course, uh, I thought it was very interesting what uh, Enda said uh, because targets do not necessarily uh, have uh, what is needed behind. But you have this kind of building coalitions and bringing together companies, civil society organizations, and local authorities, because I think it's also a way to show into the large audience uh, how this can really work, because on the ground, sometimes it's very difficult to, to explain the benefits of uh, having a natural area protected or the benefits of taking some climate action. So I think when we have uh, multi-stakeholder coalitions, the message is clear and it has this uh, on the ground uh, perspective that can be very enriching for the international process. Yeah, just, just to add to that from a, a Scottish perspective, I think um, it's, it's in the short term leading up to both uh, the, the COP15 and, and COP26, it's going to be, I think there's a challenge there because the, these are such large processes. They, we've already seen in the negotiations leading up to COP15 about how much of the targets for biodiversity should steer clear of targets for climate change because it's the jurisdiction of another organization. So I think there's there's a role there for the for the state parties and subnational governments that uh, are, are developing the NBSAPs and, and looking at the NDCs to make sure that there, there are those link-ups at the, at the national and subnational level because um, we have to make sure that uh, in, in the next 10 years that the implementation really brings those together. Um, obviously, there's the opportunity in the negotiations over the next uh, year to try and uh, make sure that the targets in, in the two organizations are aligned as much as possible. But I think that the implementation phase in the next decade for these global targets that we've developed, um, uh, there's an emphasis there on how we can how we can link those together perhaps better than they have been um, in, in, in previous times. Thank you. Thank you, John. You, you underline, you both underline a, a really critical uh, issue, which is the implementation. Like the targets are really interlock targets and so on, but the implementation uh, of those international instruments are really key to, to ensure this, um, those, those both, both crises are, are addressed. Uh, I wanted to ask another question to, to national representatives and also to sub-national um, uh, representatives uh, on how do you um, imagine uh, the future interactions of uh, subnational uh, governments with national uh, level um, for the elaboration and implementation of NBSAP and NGCs, and how 
I mean, how are they seized by the subnational level, and how they uh, included in the in the making of those documents and of those strategies, and how how would you enhance those interactions? Um, who should start? <laughs> Andrea, you want to okay. you want to start? Thank you. Um, thank you for for the opportunity. Very interesting question. I will say that. Um, it is critical that we um, facilitate a very uh, solid uh, consultation with local governments. Um, right now, we are doing our enhancement of our NDC, as I mentioned, and one of the things that we're doing is, is try to have a robust a stakeholder consultation process. Uh, the other element is that once we define and we have our different instruments at the policy level, our long-term strategy, um, now our enhanced NDC, and the other elements that we are developing is to really facilitate the alignment of these different instruments. And, and I think that if we manage to do this alignment, then it's easier to work uh, with the specific projects. And I will bring one, um, some specific cases. Uh, for example, at the coastal areas, uh, can we work better with a specific projects to try to uh, protect mangroves at, at the coastal areas? Um, at, in the urban areas, uh, we are seeing a lot of, of different projects to protect um, corridors uh, and to and, and this is the kind of elements that we need to work together with the local governments. I will not even mention mobility, which is a central element in our strategy, and we cannot move ahead if we don't engage and if we don't uh, facilitate the participation of local governments. And I would just brief a, a brief um, reflection on the previous question that you just made. This year and uh, 2020, and, and right now it will be 2021, and, and the COPs ahead will be critical years for Paris for the ambition cycle. And as we mentioned, we will see enhanced NDCs. And right now, it's the moment to try to include a specific targets, as, as somebody said, integrated targets in these enhanced NDCs. If we want to see this integrated approach, we need to accelerate the NDC implementation. And I totally agree that platforms, coalitions are great examples of, of this high ambition coalition for nature and people, as we just mentioned. There is the NDC partnership, also another very interesting coalition, and you can see more information. And of course, in the climate world, we need to close the negotiation on carbon markets. And this has to be aligned with environmental integrity. And this is a critical element in the, in the negotiations. And in CBD, of course, a robust 2020 framework with ambitious goals. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, I'm wondering if uh, Clementine would like to, I know you already presented a lot of uh, great uh, lessons in France in, on how to, do you interact with uh, the regional biodiversity agencies, but if you wish to, if you want you to go a little bit further, you, you are really welcome to do so. Yeah, thank you very much. Just maybe to, yeah, to, to go a bit further also at the, at the international level, I think there are several steps. So. For me, the first steps would be to that we collectively design at the international level a framework that is fit for purpose also for the local authorities. So that's uh, in the way we design the targets and in the way we think the framework. Um, this is also relevant for, for actors that will implement it on the ground. So for local authorities, for businesses, uh, for civil society. So yeah, truly really design the, the framework in that way. Then we will take it also at the national level and then we have to have, I think Andrea said it really well, a robust um, a consulting stakeholder processes that we have in France uh, to, to, to do our national um, climate strategy and also to do our national biodiversity strategy the same. It's very robust, very, I mean, the process is, is really, um, um, yeah, well known also by, by the different actors and, and the aim is really to 
put everyone uh, at, the, at the table uh, with their governments to also design a strategy that will be really in implemented on the ground. And we also have these uh, regional agencies, as I mentioned, to really also get back to us and, and that we understand also what is feasible, what is the local um, um, yeah, characteristic of of, uh, of the different regions. Um, and I think to go back to the to the multi-stakeholder um, initiatives and and platform uh, at the national at the international level. Sorry, this action agenda that was all, again mentioned uh, is also key in that way. So. Uh, it really exists in, in a very powerful way, I think, on, on the climate side with different uh, actors that are regularly sharing experiences and, and, and lessons learned from, from the experience at the local level, what can be replicated, what has failed, why, and so on. And this is also very important to, to get everyone uh, at, the, at the table. And maybe to, just to reflect on what um, Andy said on, on the first question, I think uh, this uh, notion of uh, mutually, a set of mutually beneficial targets uh, is, is really, really uh, important and, and, and yeah, should be, should be also a pillar uh, in the framework. And I think a target, uh, I mean, the targets that are on the table on the protection, the restoration, the special plannings, the reform of, of uh, harmful subsidies and so on, they are, um, they should be designed also as, as mutually uh, beneficial targets for climate and biodiversity. Thank you very much, Clementine. Uh, yeah, it's true that uh, at the biodiversity governance level, there is always this uh, idea of ins inspiration, ins inspire themselves from climate, uh, what has been done to climate change and platforms and, and coalitions and so on, but they also have to talk together, I mean, at all levels. So, so it, yeah, it's really, really interesting. Um, to go really quick, because it's already uh, 39, uh, a question that has been uh, asked many times in the conversation bar is about the links between climate change, biodiversity loss, and COVID-19. Uh, to, to, yeah, talk about COVID-19 once again, uh, but it's a great question on, um, uh, the opportunity of the recovery plans on the opportunity of changing the our current model of globalization, which, uh, which has been criticized, uh, and also uh, how to involve all the levels of discussion, once again, in the discussion for, for the recovery plans. Uh, we heard great lessons from, from today's presentations. So what do you think about it? What could, uh, Subnational governments and national governments do together to to be mobilized to uh, for the, for these uh, recovery plans and uh, yeah so I leave the floor to to anyone that wish to to answer the, this uh, this recent question of uh, of those links. Uh, I'm happy to uh, go first. So the um. Biodiversity loss, climate change, COVID-19 share some drivers. So international trade is uh, an indirect driver of climate change and biodiversity loss and of COVID-19. Um, if we want to have systems that are more resilient or less likely to suffer bad impacts from climate change, biodiversity loss and pandemics, then we need to make fewer demands on nature. We, so we, we basically need to consume less and we need to source more of it locally. And if we do those things, then we won't get global shocks to the socioeconomic system from um, uh, spasms such as COVID-19 occurring so simultaneously everywhere. Uh, thank you. I will um, say that this crisis um, has uh, delivered a lot of lessons. Um, I think that from the scientific part um, elements, uh, we just heard a very good analysis. We know that these infectious diseases are related to the loss of ecosystems and biodiversity. That's a fact. I think that 
we have been learning the importance of using science in policy making and the more we see the countries that are a success in managing the COVID crisis are the ones that are using science and I think that this is good the other element and, and all this integration is that if we want to build back better, and we are listening that phrase a lot, uh, we really need to do alignment on the kind of investments and policy that we will be using in the stimulus packages. And it's super important that we uh, are doing a lot of lobby, talking to our work, ministries of finance, ministries of, poly, of planning, to try to see that there is an alignment between the, our long-term strategies, our biodiversity commitments in these stimulus packages. There's a lot of money moving right now, and these, we need to avoid investments in these uh, well, areas that will destroy nature or we're... Um, or we're locked down us in, in areas that will not allow us to um, fulfill our Paris commitments. Thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, I'm just looking at the time right now and I'm really sorry, but uh, it's really frustrating, but I think we will have to close now and to, to, to wrap up. Um, I, um, I just want to, to tell you that if, we, you want to to uh, go further in the discussion you are really welcome to reach out you're really welcome to discuss through the attendify app and so do not hesitate to send us emails to 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 write to us um so we can further talk this topic which is really really interesting um i want to thank the the speakers and the participants for joining us for your time for sharing your perspectives your insights uh next webinar I think is on net, nature best solutions. So it's all, again linked to, to our topic today. It's on Friday, 22nd. It is Friday, I think it's yeah. on the International Day of Biodiversity, uh, especially as we're going towards the COP15 and COP26. Uh, so we are really uh, looking forward to those discussions. And uh, yes, I wish, I we wish everyone to be safe, healthy, and we hope that you keep your spirits up in this uh, difficult, difficult times. Uh, thank you very much for, for all the great discussion in the conversation bar also. And we will keep that in mind. And uh, yes, I, I will close right now. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.